frame all these technical problems. But Prakash and Venkatamuni and some others are trying to join, but there is some problem with them. I pray God. None of these technical problems stop us learning your word. Pray that you bless all of us. Give us sensitive voice to listen and sensitive spirit to fall at your feet and worship you. Enlighten our minds and open our ears to listen your voice and uh, encourage us, Lord. We need encouragement from you. Amen. Father, pray that your grace be upon us and uh, let we may continue to rejoice in our hearts. No matter what happened, we may continue to enjoy the presence of God in our inner being, O oh God. We thank you today for this wonderful friends. Pray that each one may enjoy the presence of God. And uh, we pray and we ask you, Spirit of God, hide us behind your cross and teach us. You are the best teacher. Jesus, speak to us. Pray that you continue to bless us. I rebuke every distraction in the name of Jesus. And I pray that all the disturbing spirits should get away from us. And I invite the Holy Spirit of God to teach us. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yesterday, we have seen Ezekiel part one, in which we had an in-depth understanding of Ezekiel's socio-political and economic background. Of course, we have seen some religious background and we try to understand the bigger picture of the book. I'm glad that God has been helping us to learn a lot. And we stopped somewhere discussing about the methodology of his teaching. Even I remember, we, I gave a little stress on communicating with our indigenous style, Asian style, Indian style. I think we stopped there. Uh, Ezekiel's method of communicating the bigger truth to those people. In particular, Ezekiel emphasized God's holiness. In his method, he particularly emphasized holiness. The heathen Jerusalem's fall was a sign of their God's lack of military power. God was punishing Israel for her sins. You know, sometimes God punishes us for our wicked ways, but we may not generalize all suffering is as a result of our sin. No, not at all. Sometimes we may need to go through that suffering, pain, and agony but sometimes because of our foolish decisions and because of our activities we invite suffering in our lives here in the lives of people of israel god was punishing israel for her sins don't be afraid that god is like a police who punishes all the time god is a loving god but at the same time he is a god of justice he had to execute justice. God could not close his eyes to their conduct. Even now today, if we take our faith as a license to live immoral life, we have to face the consequence. Because Jesus clearly said, whatever you sow, you have to reap. If you sow evil, you have to reap the consequence. Such conduct defile the relationship he had with them because these people of israel could not conduct good relationship with god of jehovah as a result they had to face the consequence one or two brothers are keep on joining there was some trouble i think they are calling but anyway we continue the teaching i have been accepting and doing multiple tasks so Ezekiel emphasized that each man is personally accountable for his own sin. 
each man is accountable for his own sin. Do you remember when Jesus healed this blind man who was born with blindness, people asked him, whose sin for his blindness? Is it uh, his father or a grandfather or his sin? Jesus said, neither his sin nor his forefather's sin. It is because of the glory of the heavenly father. Sometimes God allows us to go through pain and agony and suffering for his glory. We see in Job's life also. But let me make this statement. Ezekiel emphasized that each man is personally accountable for his sins. I am accountable for my sin. And uh, my children are accountable for their sins. Each man is accountable for his sin. Ezekiel clearly emphasized that message. Popular proverb in 18.2 also says that. Was Jehovah punishing Judah for the sins, of, sins committed by the previous wicked generations? So this is a theological question. Is God punishing Judah for the sins of previous generations? Answer we see in 1820. Each generation has to face the consequence. That particular generation rebel and also God pronounced that captivity even long, long ago. So now, lessons from Ezekiel. These friends are really taking away my concentration. They keep on joining 12 people. This is not, I have been admitting, but not accepting. I don't know what's the problem. Let's continue. Great lessons from Ezekiel. Number one, grave duty of the Lord's watchmen. Is, as you, do you remember yesterday we discussed God kept Ezekiel as a watchman? God gave him the duty of a watchman. Warn the wicked. He gave a particular duty to warn the wicked people. Instruct the wicked people. It's a very difficult job, my friends. Let me tell you. The most difficult job is to warn anybody. Because nobody likes to take criticism. All the time, 24 by 7, we need only positive things. Even this 21st century, people talk so much about inculcating positive attitude to our brains, which is good. We continue to inject positive attitude. That's fine. But people are not in a position to understand the reality of the wickedness. Even in our sermons or in our conversations, in our counseling, in our discussion, if we try to encounter people, they try to get angry and they declare war against us. I remember one day I had to deal with an angry man. He was in deep sin. I had to confront him. He tried to take some more people and he came to my room to beat me. I had to literally get away from that place. My elder, they said, you don't be here. They hid me somewhere. We had to deal that issue. It took a long time because we had to deal with him. Red-handedly, we caught him in adultery, fornication. He was not married, but uh, red-handedly, we caught him. And uh, he was the leader of the group. And we are trying to help him, to discipline him, maybe to help him to come out of that clutches of the evil one. But he tried to make a group and created a story and he wanted to beat me. It's not an easy job. When you try to help people to come out of the sinful habit, they, they don't accept. Even uh, this group, when I started innocently, I started accepting a lot of people. A young boy started coming. I know him very well. He, he's not right, really right with God. 
and he started speaking all kinds of spiritual language. I thought after maybe 15 years, I haven't seen him but in between. I thought, okay, he might have changed. As I'm busy in teaching, because I can't see each one's face. I see only my video and I see my PPT text. I'm busy because I'm concentrating on accepting friends and teaching. And after that, a few minutes of question hours and I'm, I don't have a time to talk even over the phone unless somebody calls me. But this man started interacting with others, pulling out the phone numbers, even in between chatting, asking phone numbers. And some people stopped coming. I asked them, why did you stop coming? They said, there is a guy in the group. He's simply irritating us, asking phone number, this and that. And some one or two started calling me and I started investigating this fellow at the back. He's not listening right here in this meeting. He's not listening to the lecture. He has his interior motives and then he started communicating by pulling out the phone numbers from the group and asking money. And uh, he's spoiling my testimony. A few people started asking me what's happening. Then I had to talk to him. I had to discipline myself. And I have to help him, you know, he's not really happy. I know he starts creating tension. That's a watchman job. When you try to help individuals when they are taunted by the evil, it's not easy job. They try to declare war against you. But no matter what happens, when God gives you a job, you, have not, you need to fulfill it. But it's a very difficult job. Even pastors can't, are compromising because when you try to discipline your congregation, they, you lose the members. As a result, you struggle for survival and sustenance. It's a reality, existential struggle. Because of these existential struggles, we don't have watchmen. We have only puppets who are good preachers. They have a good theology, but that may not be the right theology. There is no discipleship. You know, Jesus called us to make disciples. When you make disciples, you have to rebuke them. Jesus looked back and said, get behind me, Satan. His own loud, beloved disciple, Peter, he looked at his eyes straight away and said, get behind me, Satan. He rebuked. And today, if you disciple, if you rebuke your disciples, hardly you will have one or two. That doesn't matter. Even if you have two people, that's fine. But we should continue to be watchmen to our friends, our followers of Christ. Failure could cost him his life. You know, it costs his life to be a watchman. It costs his life. Son of man. Chapter 3, 17 and 18. I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, Hear a word, word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But this, his blood I will require at your hand. What a powerful statement. If every servant of God can fulfill this word, we will have good disciples in this nation, India, across the globe. And today we are not doing our job. And if you start doing your job, it is a struggle for existence. And people will kick you out because in the board meeting, they know how to make politics and they kick you out because you are playing the role of a watchman to the organization. It's not, it's not an easy job. But God says, if you don't do, I, I will require at your hand. The blood I will require at your hand. It's a difficult job, but you have to do it. When you confront, when you do this job, you may, dis, you may be displaced. But God will not never displace you, my friends. God will never displace you. He takes you into his hands and he will provide everything for you to survive and sustain. The clay and iron plate is Gil's message. The sketch on the clay tablet 
symbolized the seas of Jerusalem and the iron tablet, the obstacle, the people erected between themselves and God. You know, in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we read, You also, son of man, take a clay tablet that lay it before you and pottery on it a clay. Je city Jerusalem lay seas against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mount against it. Set camp, camps against it also, and place battering rams against it and all around. No, he did it exactly. In a pictorial way, God instructed him to demonstrate the truth Ezekiel had to teach all these lessons to people of Israel. Cutting off his hair and beard, having takla and uh, shaving everything. By scattering part of his hair, he showed the survival of, survival of a remnant whose hearts would be clean, cleansed. In a different ways, Ezekiel communicated his message to the people of Israel and prostitution of God's people. You know? Prostitution of people, the most graphic description of spiritual adultery in the Bible can be seen here in the book of Ezekiel. The most graphic description of spiritual adultery in the Bible, Jehovah's bride had paid the heathen to commit scourge with her. And you know, a spiritual adultery. And today we have all this kind of contacts in our fellowships. You built your high places at the head of a head of every road and made your beauty to be behaved by her. You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multi multiplied your acts of harlotry. You also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, your very fleshly neighbors, and increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. You now, the spiritual adultery was the reality in his religious context. Even now, in this postmodern 21st century in the church, we have this kind of spiritual adultery in the name of spirituality, you know, um, uh, coming and looting. Devil comes like a white angel. You know, it looks like angel, but it is not an angel. It is a white angel. And now today we have so many white angel believers, pastors, servants, and ordinary members. You know, the spiritual adultery is the problem of the 21st century Christianity. The spiritual adultery. You know, there is no God. There is no value for spiritual values by hook or crook we need to continue our mission work either you have no we call it in the mission terminology qualitative and quantitative both are important we need we need to have a quantitative ministry we need so many numbers because the book of acts talk about numbers which is very essential at the same time we need quality the discipleship mentoring nurturing, a vision of restoration, valley of dry bones. We see there a vision of restoration. The bones were the whole house of Israel. God was going to give these bones new life. You know, a new life when there was a spiritual adultery in and they died in spirituality. In spiritually, they are dead. To that dead people, God says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, do you think that these bones will live? Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, my, oh my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up from your graves. Can God bring people from the grave? Yes, he can. We see in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus 
brought Lazarus out of the grave after three days when Jesus stood in front of the tomb and he just said, Lazarus, come out. The Lazarus came out of the tomb. And God can do amazing things. Dead people can live. And there is a life in him. And, and God here gives that mission to prophet. The whole house of Israel was dead because of their spiritual adultery. And God wants to raise them again by giving a new life. Ezekiel's theme in the first part, Jerusalem must be destroyed. You know, you remember because of their sins, Jerusalem must be destroyed. False teachers encouraged peace and security. They were wrong. Even now, the false prophets are wrong. Even now, there is a false peace and false security has been taught in the churches, in the fellowships. There are no people who warn people who are living in the sin. If we can analyze our sermons in the church and here and there, in the public meeting or private meeting, hardly the sermons have such great rich theology of sin and its consequence. There are preachers who simply talk about sin and sin and sin, but they don't talk about the rich theology of sin and the consequence of sin and the provision of God that has been done on the cross. You know, false teachers encouraged peace and security. Why? When you continue to speak about peace and security, you will have a lot of acceptance, the psychological need of acceptance. You continue to talk about blessing, talk about you know, today you'll hear my message. Oh, praise God, you have come today. Let me assure you, God is going to bless you. And tomorrow you are going to have a job. And then tomorrow you have a beautiful wife and you will have a car. And no matter what happens, you continue to prosper. Those churches are having huge dance today. Even online or offline. Because people are addicted to such kind of false prophecy. People are addicted and preachers are also addicted. It is like, you know, a kind of a toxic mind. Yesterday we were talking about toxic mind. When you are fully drunk, drunk in state, you have a toxic mind and you don't know what you do. In the same way, preacher also, preachers also, they don't know what to do. Their minds are filled with the toxic mind and preaching only 20 words by 7, preaching and all sorts of false miracles. Today, what happened? All these miracles. On the stage doing puppet shows. You know, this stomach ache gone, praise God, you know, this and that. Of course, I do believe in miracles, my friends. I believe. And I believe in healings. Even in my ministry, I have seen several times. But there is a purpose behind those miracles. The, those healings are a part of ministry, but they contribute for the kingdom of God. Not to build my kingdom. But today, what happened to all these miracle workers? Where are they now? Even in, in, in uh, Telugu states, we have a number of people doing all puppet shows. The other day, uh, the, the, the news gave a lot of uh, this kind of interesting stories. They brought this fellow who was struggling with the sickness and of going to hospital. They brought him to that particular place. Four days, five days they were there and giving all false hope of security and peace without any medicine. And all they kept the, and uh, when the person almost dead, they pushed him into an ambulance, moved around into the city for the whole 24 by 7, even praying in the ambulance. Finally, the, the members of the family came to know that he is dead. Such people are drawing a lot of crowds, peace and security. Even in Ezekiel's time, false teachers encouraged peace and security. They were wrong. And today, these preachers are also wrong. These so these believers are also wrong. In the second part of the book, in the second part of the book, to combat de despair, he taught that they had a future hope returning. If you repent and turn to God, there is a future hope. You need to repent of your sin. From the beginning of all these prophetic books from major prophets and the minor prophet books, the only theme, God Keep on asking people to return. Turn to God and rejoice in hope. Turn to God and rejoice in blessing. 
turn to God and be blessed. Turn to God and enjoy the eternal life. When the calamity came, the people needed hope. The second part of Ezekiel gives them that hope. And today we have a pandemic situation, calamity situation. What we need is a hope. Hope to survive from this unseen, terrific virus. God gives you hope, my friends. Come to God. There is a life in Jesus because Jesus gives life. Jesus said, I am the life. He is the only one who said, I am the life. When you come to him, the one who is the source of life gives you life to survive and sustain in any context because there is no death for a child of God. When you become a child of God, you are destined to hope and life. Individual responsibility. As a corporate responsibility, God asked them to turn and Ezekiel also preached individual responsibility. God desires the sinner's responsible res repentance. Sinner's repentance. But each will stand or fall on his own. In other words, each individual is responsible for his own life. You know, you are not responsible for your wife's life you are responsible for your own life you are, if your wife is a good believer that doesn't guarantee you that you also will be in the kingdom of god sometimes i ask young people when are you saved and they say oh my father is a pastor in one big famous bible school i was dealing with a an individual young man sitting in front of me in the library i asked him brother when are you saved he was very angry. I could understand his feelings. I am here preparing for a full-time ministry. And also that degree gives him license to teach pastors, to get a big job as a professor job in a big Bible school, a school that trains individuals to become pastors. I am asking that individual straight away question, when are you saved? He was angry. He said, are you joking with me? My grandfather was such a great pastor. He was quoting a great pastor. My father is a bishop, by the way. That doesn't guarantee you to be in the kingdom of God. You need to have that individual relationship with God and you need to have the salvation. Salvation is individual, not corporate. And that day we both had a long discussion and he became a good friend after some time. And praise God, after discussing with him, several months he accepted jesus as a lord and savior in the bible school a person who is going to get a license to become a professor in the bible school of course a lot of professors don't have a born again experience it is a shame to tell this as a professor of a bible school and a lot of professors they don't have the individual relationship with god as a chemistry teacher is teaching in a university and the Bible teacher also teaches a theology in a Bible school. But God here takes individual responsibility for spiritual life. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his own ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your reign. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Why should you die as an individual? God gives a new spirit, a new life. When yesterday, do you remember I have been telling you are the temple of the living God? Your body is the temple of living God. Why should you die? God should be there in our hearts. And we should continue to rejoice and enjoy the presence of God. The, individual, the unique message of Ezekiel here, idolatry. Ezekiel shows that idolatry was an abandoning of the reason for Israel's existence, to worship and serve God. And today, son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all, of all, of at all by them? And today 
we replace idols in the place of God. Messianic hope. Ezekiel shows many prophecies concerning the care and welfare, spiritually speaking, of the coming Messiah. You know, there are so many Messianic prophecies here. And uh, the, 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 the Ezekiel and Revelation have a lot of similarities. We need to study these books together. Like how I said, Daniel and his Revelation should study together. The four living creatures, Ezekiel 1.5 and Revelation 4.6. Rainbow around the throne, Ezekiel 1, 28 and Revelation 4, 8. Eating the scroll, God says to Ezekiel, eat the scroll. Even in Revelation 10, 10, we see that. Sealing of God's servants, we see in both. So today, before we conclude, burning the city, fall of Tyre and Babylon. God dwelling in the midst of man. God in the land of Magog. We see all these similarities, Ezekiel and Revelation. And there are several other similarities like uh, the seed placed on a high mountain, the city measure, the river is issuing from the temple, the gates of various tribes, tribal names. We see a lot of similarities between these two books. But let me conclude, prophecies against the nations. Ezekiel not only prophesies to people of Israel, but he prophesies to the nations of others also because God is the God of all nations. Ezekiel, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, saw the God's hand controlling all the nations. Book denounces the wickedness and foretells the Lord's judgment. Ammon, Moab, Edom, Sidon and Tyre, Philistia. You know, he keep on prophesizes to them. Lessons to be learned before concluding. My time is almost up. Finding hope in God. Before I conclude, let me tell you, my friends, you need to find hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a hope in him. He is the only one who gives us hope. Three lessons to be learned before we conclude. Even when we sin, there is still hope. We all are sinful be beings because Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God welcomes. There is a hope. Still there is a hope. That hope Ezekiel offers to people of Israel. Lord Jesus offers to all of us that hope. Number two, even when we experience hardship, there is still hope. Even when we experience hardship, Still, there is hope. I know many of you today are experiencing hardships, financial hardships, relational hardships, and insecure hardships, not knowing what will happen to the future. But let me tell you, there is still hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God is still available. He still sits on the throne. He still rules and he is still our God and Savior. He welcomes us. Number three, lesson number three. Even when all seems lost, there is still hope from through God. You know, even when all seems lost, there is still hope through God. Job lost everything, but he hoped on God. The end was amazing. God blessed him. And today, this coronavirus may shatter our hopes, dreams, ambitions, and visions. But there is still hope through the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me assure you, my friends, come back to God. Rejoice in hope. There is still hope in the Lord Jesus. He continues to help us. If you have any questions or concerns, you can post me. And if you want to listen this message again, and if you want to forward this video, uh, every day's video has been uploaded to this um, YouTube channel. You can click this email ID, can be seen on the screen, or maybe you can type Dr. Kotana, you will get the YouTube channel. You can see all those videos from the beginning. And if you have any concerns or uh, prayer requests, you can post. We may not have a lot of time to discuss questions, but we can discuss. Uh, let me pray and conclude. Let's all close our eyes and look to God in prayer. Friends, 
we all are weak, fragile human beings with a lot of weaknesses. It is a reality. But God helps us in our weaknesses. That's the reason the Almighty God left the glory, majesty, and he touched the evil ground to accept the weak people like you and me. He stands with us. Come to him and ask him, Lord, have mercy on me. He restores us. He gives us hope. My friend, let me tell you, God loves you. He wants to restore you. He wants to give you a new hope and a new spirit. May God bless all of you. Make a commitment to God. And God comes on behalf of you. Lord Jesus, this evening, I pray for all of my friends who are attending this meeting. I pray for all of these, my friends. Bless them, encourage them, motivate them. Let them return to you and rejoice in hope. I pray that nothing may distract their focus from you, O oh God. Bless them. Release your heavenly blessings, spiritually, physically, financially, in every aspect. They may continue to enjoy the presence of God. Have mercy on them, O oh Lord. Help them to be positive. Help them to come to you. And today, I pray for their needs. I don't know what kind of needs they have, but I pray that you meet all of their needs. Jesus, you said, if two people, whatever they agree on earth, will be agreed in heaven. And today, we all together pray, let your kingdom come in a special way. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends.